As a little kid, I used to dream of being on the Lewis and Clark expedition, which in 1804 and 1805 explored the newly purchased western regions of the United States, going up the Missouri River to the Pacific Ocean. I was also fascinated by the explorers who endeavored to be the first, Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay, of course, first to stand on top of Mount Everest in 1953, and as a little kid, absolutely indelibly imprinted into my mind, at school watching Neil Armstrong take the first steps on the moon in 1969. My guest today was one of those firsts, one of the great explorers of our time. He reached the deepest point in the ocean known as Challenger Deep in 1960. U.S. Navy Lieutenant Don Walsh and Swiss oceanographer and explorer Jacques Picard piloted the Bathyscaphe Trieste 35,797 feet below the surface of the ocean when it became the first manned vessel to reach the bottom of the Mariana Trench, the deepest point in the Earth's seabed. Given the recent news of the Triton submersible disaster and the public's voracious appetite for news about not only what went wrong on the submersible disaster, but how a maverick explorer, if you will, like Stockton Rush, could get away with skirting so many rules, if you will, regulations, and still command a ticket price of $250,000 for the opportunity to become a mission specialist to take it to the bottom of the sea to visit the wreck of the Titanic. That the Titanic is still claiming victims 111 years after she first sank is actually a mind-boggling intermingling of time and space, a continuation of a completely avoidable disaster. My conversation with the one and only Don Walsh from his home in Oregon, well, it was two years ago, and at the time there is no conceivable way we could have predicted the disaster on the Titan submersible, and fittingly, Ironically, it seems that our entire conversation is so pertinent to everything that took place on the submersible. A perfect conversation for the times we're living in now. Later in the video, I'm going to ask a question that I hope you'll stick around to answer, and it is pertaining to the Everest Mystery Channel and my conversation with Don Walsh. Don Walsh is my guest today. He is an explorer, an adventurer, a diver, an engineer, historian, journalist, researcher. You'd think that Don Walsh might have been happy with the accomplishments of 1960, going to the bottom of the ocean. But for him, that was just the beginning. In 2001, he received the Explorers Club Medal. And in 2010, he was awarded the National Geographic Society's highest award, the Hubbard Medal. Oh. And he has been to the site of the Titanic. A quick note for my Everest mystery viewers right now. The full version of my interview, the segment is over 30 minutes long, is over on Patreon or in the members section. Check it out in the links below in the description where there's also other exclusive content for members and Patreon supporters. Here is my conversation with the inspiring and ever engaging Don Walsh from his home in southwestern Oregon. You know, only a few people get the distinction of being the first to, if you will, one of the poles, you know, whether it's Everest, North Pole, South Pole, the deepest, and you have that distinction. Well, before I start that, you remind me of something that one of the big takeouts for me and ever since I achieved some recognition with the uh, diving work 62 years ago was... Uh, the people I meet along the way. You, all of a sudden you have access to a lot of different people. Not that they're seeking you out, but to get co-mingled with them. You're at the same head table mm. uh, because you have a, a program and Walter Cronkite sitting mm. next to him at dinner. He's got something else he's supposed to be doing, but you, it, it, there's a certain normalized factor uh, of people who have attained something. So you don't have to uh, do the one up stop. They know who you are. You know who they are. That's off the table. You're just visiting. And uh, I find it very, and it's not small talk. So I'm just really serious, like the future of exploration. This all comes, one thing kind of knocks on to another. It's amazing. I don't ask for any of it. It just happens. Truly, the 
most lasting and meaningful aspect of it all are the human relationships that are built along the way. But when you were down, going down into that, it 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 might as well have been going to the moon. I'm and and I can't imagine that you didn't before you actually submerged, knowing you were going there. That like this could be it. Like. And you're and and I and I know you had talked about this. This could be the end. I mean, we could we could not. It's a chance we don't make it. But you had two brains, two smart, young, highly functioning people in there, which I believe you said one time that was probably the best working, you know, kind of machine we could put in the Trieste, right? Well, uh, one way is you know when you're training to do something or getting ready to do something we have what you call a skill luck ratio. And you always want to keep skill well beyond 50%. But there's always going to be a need for that luck too in there. We practice a long time. You know, first of all, I came to the Trieste as a qualified submarine officer. That means I earned my dolphins, same as wings and the aviators have. Mm-hmm. And so I've been in submarines for a couple of years at that point. They're pretty complicated things. Mm-hmm. And all the systems in a submerging ship Mm-hmm. Uh, not simple, even though the ones we were driving around in had been actually built during World War II, upgraded since then. But basically, basic systems, the engines, the electricity, the compressed air, all of that uh, were uh, uh, legacy uh, mm-hmm. systems. So uh, I came into something that sort of had two moving parts, uh, a bathyscaphe, because it's just an underwater balloon, you know, one part of the balloon, and it's oh. filled with lighter than water substance. Huh. petroleum and got hanging beneath that balloon is a cabin for the people that's it we were pretty much experienced in operating the thing and what the good noises were and uh, and things that we hadn't heard before then we could give them our full attention and so the whole thematic of our dive program in guam was to emphasize routine and it's just like a new airplane even even a, a 737 comes out of the boeing factory it gets a pretty rigorous flight test program. It mm. doesn't roll out of the factory in Everett, Washington, and go straight over to SeaTac and load passengers for Atlanta. Yeah, it gets tested for a, a period of time, maybe ten or twelve days, with very elaborate system checks. Even though it's the thirteen thousandth seven thirty-seven ever built, they treat it like it's the first time. Those are your test pilots. Yeah, and that's an analog to what Doc and I were doing. We were not scientists. Yeah, people say, "Well, he didn't do any research." No, he didn't. We we're just trying to make sure the damn thing is reliable, safe, and useful. Mm. So, uh, yeah, it. Uh, when people say you're scared or afraid, no, not really. We yeah. we tested it so much, we knew you're in your game. But you know, being afraid just saps your you know your mental acuity. Mm-hmm. That's not good. Then you're unsafe. Yeah. We we're really paying attention to tr- through training and repetition. We knew what to do. We knew what normal was and abnormal. Then if it came, we know how to take care of it mm. or try to. You're listening to my conversation with legendary explorer and oceanographer Don Walsh, who in 1960, along with Swiss oceanographer and explorer Jacques Picard, piloted the Bathyscaphe Trieste 35,797 feet below the surface of the sea when it became the first crewed vessel to reach the bottom of the Mariana Trench, the deepest point in the Earth's seabed. After 62 years, you can't imagine how many times I've been asked, we ever scared? How deep did you get? What did you see? What was it like? Tell me about the Trieste. Why don't you begin with your shoe size when you were growing up? A lot of writers, you know, they want me to write the goddamn, dictate the story for them and put their byline on it. In, in, you know, you can only do a first once in the world. And, you know, the, the top of Everest and the North Pole, the South Pole, break the speed of sound, the bottom of the ocean. So young explorers looking for a way to, to spend whatever might be a future expedition in a meaningful way, what's left? <laughs> and you said, you know, you get a Hispanic speaking um, Vietnam veteran female with uh, only one leg climbing Mount Everest. 
okay, that's a journey of internal uh, exploration, self. Yeah. But the rest of the world, the, the, what's the purpose to it in terms of adding to the commonwealth of knowledge of humankind? Mm -hmm. Zip, zero. That's one of the big problems we have in the Explorers Club. When I was on the Flag and Honors Committee for 14 years, we, you know, we, we uh, award flags to certain expeditions. You got a rather, rather elaborate uh, application to basically what it all says is, what are you going to contribute to science by field work? If you strip out all the crowd and crap, yeah. crap on, in the application, but you get adventures and get explorers and there's a definite difference there. Mm -hmm. And it's often hard. People come in and say, I got this great idea and uh, okay but it doesn't contribute to science. And the whole idea is contribution of the knowledge of humankind through field exploration. Now, I define exploration and, uh, and uh, as uh, curiosity acted upon. And uh, I told John Glenn that once and he used it and, and Jim Cameron uses it also as a definition of exploration. I, I, you know, I'm not copyright, I'm just saying that it had <laughs> right. legs. Right. And, uh, you know, everybody's curious. The full version of my interview, the segment is over 30 minutes long, is over on Patreon or in the members section. Check it out in the links below in the description where there's also other exclusive content for members and Patreon supporters. Okay, now the question for the viewers. A good friend of mine, Mark Sinnott, he's a New York Times bestselling author, big wall climber and explorer. We were on Everest together in 2019. He has said that an adventure is when you don't know the outcome of your journey. So the question to you is, if there is a snafu or something goes wrong on an extreme expedition operated by a company that hasn't gone through extensive testing and certifications, should there be any type of rescue mounted to try and save the occupants, whether that be on land, sea, or in space? Let me know in the comments below, yes or no. I want to hear your thoughts. And while you're taking the time to do that, let me know where you're coming from today. If you like what you've seen and heard today, I hope you'll take a moment to subscribe to this channel and also think about becoming a member on this page or my Patreon page to support the work that I do here where you'll get exclusive content. You can find my Patreon link in the notes and here on this page, click the join button and you can check out the different levels of membership. In the meantime, do a kind deed, celebrate the successes of others, endeavor to make the world a better place by doing a kind deed for somebody you don't know without looking for anything in return. Be well, take care of yourselves. Thank you for being here. Have a beautiful day.